Hi everybody, I'm Francis, uh, and I'm one of the co-organizer of the Montreal C++ user group. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, and thank um, Autodesk for providing us the Zoom tonight. Uh, also, this uh, meeting should be recorded also on our side with Zoom. It's not clear yet how we will distribute it or uh, well, we need to uh, figure this out afterward. Um, and uh, also, uh, if you have an, any interest presenting anything to your either local meetup you know your organizer go and uh, tell them or if you want to uh, present to this like pan canadian meetup uh call your organizer too uh, <laughs> uh, if you are looking for a job in those difficult time or you are hiring please uh, write in the chat below if you're hiring so people can see you and send you private message and you can exchange uh, email and what's not to uh, make everybody happy. Uh, I'm Now it's time for the presentation. Uh, I'm glad to introduce Bryce adelstein Uh He has a uh, pretty long uh, title uh, list. I won't go over them. It, it, they're all already on the, your screen. And uh, it's off to you, Bryce. Thanks, Francis. Uh, yes, yeah, so as Francis said, I'm Bryce. Uh, I work at NVIDIA, um, where I primarily focus on programming languages and uh, programming language standardization. I am the chair of the US uh, Standards Committee for Programming Languages and also the chair of the C++ Committee's Library Evolution Working Group. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about um, a pretty cool project my team has uh, been working on for the past few years um, called libq++, which is a port of libc++ uh, to uh, GPUs. Um, so I'm going to assume a little bit of familiarity with CUDA throughout this talk. I think it'll still be interesting even to those of you who may not uh, uh, use CUDA or be CUDA experts though. Um, so first let me just explain what CUDA is. So CUDA C++ is an extension of ISO C++ that lets you uh, program GPUs. Um, so uh, it's best to think of it as a superset of ISO C++. You can write uh, regular ISO C++ host code um, as you normally would without any restrictions. Um, and then you can use a subset of ISO C++ to write device code. And there's some set of things that uh, uh, aren't supported um, uh, there, but we're working as hard as possible to close that gap, to, to make it possible for you to just write regular ISO C++ and have it run transparently accelerated on your GPU. So um, we've made pretty much all of the parts of the core language um, work. There's a few caveats with, thing, with things like function pointers. Um, but there is one big missing gap in what CUDA C++ supports today. Um, so ISO C++ consists of two um, key components, the core language and the standard library. And if you go and look at the uh, C++ 20 standard, it's um, something like 1700 uh, pages and like the first five or 600 of those pages, maybe 700 of those pages covers uh, the core language and the rest of it's just the library. So the majority of the C++ specification is actually the library. Um, and C++ without a standard library is really a very severely diminished experience. It's, it's, a, it's a core part of the language. Now in CUDA C++, we have most of the core language, but what about the library? So until now, we haven't had one. 
So what's the what's the benefits that, that we NVIDIA get get out of this? Like why why would we want to go and build um, uh, support for the C++ standard library in CUDA C++? Well, there's there's three primary reasons. The first is um, platform feature exposure. So the standard library abstractions are very useful for platforms like Windows or Linux or Mac or Android or GPUs to expose um, functionality that operates in a very specific way on their platform in a uniform abstraction that uh, all programmers can use portably across uh, you know, any, any platform. Um, so we're able to expose some of the goodness of our underlying platform through standard library abstractions. And we're also able to sort of hide bugs and limitations in how our platform works. There's additionally a productivity and a performance argument. Uh, a lot of CUDA C++ programmers end up wasting their time re-implementing standard library facilities, and they often encounter performance and correctness pitfalls when doing so. For example, you might think that it's pretty straightforward to implement something like std complex, but if you don't ensure that your std complex data type is properly aligned on our platform, you can uh, take a real performance uh, penalty. Copying them can be up to two times slower. And then finally, there's the uh, a consistency and interoperability argument. Um, having duplicated re-implementations of standard library facilities across our ecosystem uh, uh, creates a lot of interoperability problems. You know, if my library has a complex data type and your library has a complex data type and Connor's library has a complex data type, uh, and then somebody wants to use all three of those libraries, well, then they have to traffic in all these different complex data types and maybe they can be converted between each other and maybe not. And it just gets to be painful. These sorts of vocabulary types, there should be one definition of them that's provided by the platform. So we've uh, decided to fill in those question marks uh, with uh, uh, functionality and that is libq++, which was initially released in CUDA 10.2. So this is a, um, it is a opt-in, heterogeneous and incremental uh, CUDA C++ standard library. So I'll explain uh, what that means. So it's opt-in, which means that it does not interfere with or replace your host standard library. So everything in STUD and all of your normal standard library uh, includes vector, et cetera, all of those um, are, are left untouched. Those are provided by whatever host compiler you're using, GCC, MSVC, et cetera. Then we provide two namespaces. Um, there's the CUDA colon colon std namespace, and uh, the corresponding headers are in CUDA slash std slash, and that contains uh, strictly conforming implementations of C++ standard library facilities, for example, Atomic or type traits. Then additionally, we have the CUDA colon colon namespace uh, and the CUDA slash uh, headers. And those um, are conforming extensions to ISO C++. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those look like uh, in a few slides. And so here's an example for atomic. So you can still write std colon colon atomic, and that is something that you can use in host code. You can write CUDA colon colon std colon colon atomic, and that type of atomic can be used in host code, it can be used in device code, and it can be used concurrently from both host and device code. And then you can also use uh, CUDA colon colon atomic, which is uh, our version of a CUDA std atomic with um, conforming extensions. In this case, the conforming extension is this additional template parameter that specifies a thread scope. So none of the interfaces are any different. Nothing is really functionally changed that much, but because it's not a strict um, uh, strictly conforming to uh, the C++ standard, we, we have it in a distinct namespace. All right, so then the next property of this library is, is that everything is intended to be heterogeneous. So any objects um, that are copyable or movable can migrate between host and device code. 
Um, host and device code can call all member functions. There's no, you know, device only functions. There's no host only functions. And host and device can concurrently use synchronization primitives like uh, CUDA Atomic. Uh, there's some caveats there. The synchronization primitives have to be in managed memory and they have to have the, uh, the system level thread scope. And then the final property is incremental, which is just uh, our way of saying that not everything in the standard library is in libcu++ today. Um, each release, we plan on adding more and more features. Uh, our focus on features is primarily two categories. The first is facilities that need a specialized CUDA implementation. So things that expose um, uh, platform specific facilities like concurrency, clocks, syscalls, IO, et cetera. Those are things that uh, it, it's, it's non-trivial to implement those. There's a different implementation in, on a GPU than what you do on a CPU. And then we have um, our sort of our essential facilities that everybody is going to be re-implementing anyways. So these are things like type traits, tuple, um, variant, optional, etc. These are things where the implementation in uh, GPU code is not going to be any different than the implementation in CPU code. There's nothing platform specific about how you'd implement tuple. Um, but it's, it's still very valuable for us to provide these facilities so that people don't have to go off and recreate them themselves. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, libq++ is based on LLVM's libc++. It's forked from LLVM's uh, libc++. Uh, we, we follow upstream pretty closely. The license is Apache 2.0 with LLVM exception. And we're already um, uh, making contributions back to the community. Like we contributed um, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, atomic uh, changes and enhancements, and then an implementation of the C++20 synchronization library. So the release schedule, we, we put out the first release of this in CUDA 10.2, um, uh, which contained atomics and type traits. And the, uh, the, the next version comes out in CUDA 11, which was just announced uh, last week. And that contains um, the C++20 synchronization library, support for chrono clocks, and ratio, and then parts of functional. And then some of our future priorities are things like more concurrency, primitives, providing a high quality mem copy implementation, um, complex, tuple, array, utility, CMath, string processing, and then probably eventually the hard things like IO too. Okay, so now let's, um, let's take a look at Atomic, which is the, uh, the marquee feature of uh, libq++. As I mentioned, there's two versions of Atomic in libq++. There's CUDA colon colon Atomic, which um, takes an additional template parameter, which is a thread scope. And then there's CUDA colon colon std Atomic. Um, and that is just, it's literally just a type alias for CUDA colon colon Atomic with a thread scope of system. And the, uh, the thread scopes um, uh, indicate what um, set of threads the uh, uh, atomic should be consistent with. So thread scope system gives you the behavior that ISO C++ prescribes of uh, consistency with all threads in the system. Thread scope device gives you consistency with all threads on the current processor, either the CPU or the GPU. And then thread scope block gives you consistency with all threads within the GPU block, and that's somewhat specific to uh, GPUs. Okay, so let's, um, let's look into some examples of, uh, of what you'd have to do in, in CUDA to write atomics before libq++ and what you'd have to do today. So this is just a simple function that is intended to um, signal some flag. And in legacy CUDA C++, the way you, you were uh, supposed to write this or the way that um, was notionally correct for you to write this would be to make the flag a volatile and then uh, to just assign to it. Now this technically might happen to work, um, but it's undefined behavior because um, volatile does not apply atomicity. Um, on some of our older GPUs, that happened to be the case 
but it's still undefined behavior, and that's not the case on uh, newer platforms, and we certainly don't guarantee that that will be the case going forward. All right, so th there's one thing that we sort of missed here, which is um, we needed to write a uh, offense uh, before this, this right here. And uh, the fence operation should really be fused onto the store um, as they are with C++ Atomics, um, because then, you know, you can't forget it. Um, and if you, you do forget it here, it's even more undefined behavior than it was previously. All right, so if we want to try to move away from using Volatile, um, uh, we could try to use the CUDA Legacy Atomic API, the Atomic uh, capital letter uh, intrinsics. Um, but uh, what we really want for this case is we want um, an atomic store with release semantics. Unfortunately, the old CUDA Atomics API doesn't have an atomic store. There's only an atomic exchange. So we could sort of write a, a, a crude equivalent of an atomic exchange by exchanging the flag with the value of one. Um, but we are still not getting the, uh, the memory semantics that we want here without the fence. We still need to have the fence because all of the legacy CUDA atomics um, are relaxed uh, atomics. And so we need the fence there to ensure um, release ordering. And uh, you'll also note we have to uh, we have to cast away the volatileness because the legacy atomic APIs um, uh, don't take volatile pointers. So this is all just pretty pretty unpleasant. Now using libq++, uh, this is a lot cleaner. You can just write atomic bool, and this you can use this on host on device. You can use it to synchronize thread, like threads that are on the host and device. They can both concurrently be um, trying to signal this flag. And uh, another like very subtle improvement here, one of the, the major benefits of using C++ Atomics is that you can write the type that you um, logically mean in your code. Um, in the previous uh, API, um, the API only provides sort of int32 and int64. Um, overloads. But what we really just want here is the notion of an atomic pool. Uh, with C++ Atomics, you can just write that. Okay, so the there is, we can still do a little bit better here though. Um, we're, we're just assigning to this atomic flag variable with the assignment operator here, which works, um, but with the C++ Atomics, um, uh, all of the implicit operations like assignment um, use a use the strongest uh, memory semantics, which is sequential consistency. And we don't need that here. All that we need is release semantics. So to do that, um, we can use the more explicit store API here. So we say, hey, store true to this flag um, with uh, release memory semantics. All right. And there's an even better form of this that we can now write um, using C++20's new atomic wait and notify API, which is available in libq++. We're the first standard library to actually have an implementation of this. And our implementation uh, has been backported to C++11. So if you're using libq++, you can uh, use this all the way back to C++11. Um, and so what we do is, is the same thing as before, we do this store with memory order release to the flag. And then after that, we call notify all. And what notify all will do is it will wake up anyone who was waiting for the value of this atomic to change. It'll make more sense when we see the other side of this operation, the pole side. Okay, so here is the, uh, the, the poll side here. So we've got um, some function that's going to pull the flag and then um, read from some uh, uh, data. Um, so presumably on the store, on the signal side, you wrote to the data and then on this, on this read side, we're, we're, we're waiting to receive the flag signal and then read from the, uh, the data variable. So again, we're using volatile here. So in this while loop, we are just doing volatile loads of the flag to wait for it to become uh, uh, not equal to uh, uh, one. And, um, 
uh, it's also sort of unfortunate that we're the way that we're polling, we've just got a naive spin loop um, with no back off here. So this is going to behave badly under contention. So this used to sort of be notionally correct in CUDA, but again, it's no longer the case because um, uh, volatile does not apply atomicity. And this is not just true for CUDA, it's true for C and C++ as well. Uh, don't write volatile when you mean atomic, they're not the same thing. Um, now, again, we're missing something here, and, and what we're missing is uh, the fence. Uh, which we need to get the um, memory order acquire semantics that we want. And again, because the fence is not um, attached to the operation, it's very easy to forget this. And if you do forget it, you're not going to get a compilation error and you might not even get a runtime error. You just get a very subtle race condition. So instead of doing a volatile load of the flag, uh, we should really be doing an atomic load acquire. Uh, again, we can't really do this in the legacy CUDA Atomics API because there is no atomic load. So one trick that people have often done is to use atomic add of zero, which, you know, if you add nothing to something, then you're just going to get back that value. So that is the equivalent of an atomic load. But it's sort of an un unfortunate anti-pattern. Again, we have to cast away the volatileness here. And uh, we still need the fence because once again, the um, CUDA legacy atomics are all relaxed. So we still need the fence to ensure that we get acquired semantics. This is what the, uh, the libq++ version looks like. Again, we've gotten rid of all of, the, all of the nonsense here. We've just got an atomic bool flag. And in the while loop, we're just doing operator not on uh, the flag, which is one of these implicit operations that will have uh, sequential consistency. So it'll be correct, but it'll be a little bit conservative. And we don't need to have any explicit fence here because in C++ Atomics, the fences are attached to the operation. Now we can make this a little bit better. Um, we can switch to using memory order require by using the explicit dot load. Um, but we still, we still have a problem, which is that we have this um, spin loop without any back off, and it's going to be bad under contention. Because if you can imagine, if you have 10,000 threads, all of which are trying to um, load this flag, uh, and they're all trying to you know, get the cache line for this flag, and they're all competing with each other. Um, and the, the more threads that participate, the, uh, the worse the situation gets. Uh, the longer each thread has to wait. So ideally what you want is, you know, if a thread comes in and is pulling this uh, flag, after a while, if it's been, uns if it hasn't seen the value that, it's, that it wants, it should just say, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna come back later. It's like if, you, if you're going to a store and there's a really long line at the store, and instead of waiting in the line, you just say, I'm gonna go do something else and come back later and hopefully the line will be shorter. So we can, uh, use the C++20 atomic wait and notify API here to um, get that, uh, those back off semantics. So instead of having a while loop that's pulling on the flag, we can um, wait for the value of the flag to change. So this uh, dot wait method on atomic, um, you give it a value and what it does is it, is it will wait until the flag or the, until the atomic is no longer equal to that value. It, that can be a little bit confusing. You might think that you're saying wait until it is equal to this value. No, what it's saying is wait until it's no longer equal to this value. And under the hood, this will do some sort of um, uh, clever, efficient waiting mechanism. It'll depend on your platform, what that actually looks like. If you're interested in more details of that, you should go look at my uh, CPPCon or meeting C++ talk on the C++20 synchronization library. I'm sure Connor can drop a link to that in, uh, in the chat for people. All right, so there's some other problems with uh, the legacy CUDA atomics that libq++ solves. Um, the first is that mixing scopes um, uh, was not something that we caught at compile time with the legacy atomics because the legacy atomics the scope of an atomic operation was attached to the operation itself um, instead of to the type. Uh, with libq++ atomics, 
the scope of an atomic is a part of the type. It's that second template parameter, which means that if you write a function like signal flag that expects a uh, system scope atomic and you try to pass it a device scope atomic, you're going to get a compilation error because it's expect like it's, it's not the right type. So this is this ensures that you don't mix um, uh, atomic scopes at compile time. It's also difficult to uh, write uh, heterogeneous code with CUDA legacy atomics because they only work in device code. Um, so you can write atomic add in, in, you know, in the device part of your host device function, but uh, you, you got to do something else in the CPU um, part of your function. That's not the case with libq++ because as mentioned earlier, everything in libq++ is designed to be heterogeneous. It works in host code, it works in device code, and it works across host and device code. So here's what uh, the, the libq++ version of that function looks like. There's no if def, there's no ugliness. It's just one syntax for both host and device code. So the, the moral of the story here is you should, um, you should stop using legacy CUDA atomics. Um, uh, you should migrate to libq++ atomics because they're, they're just better. Um, they sequential consistency and acquire release semantics aren't first class citizens in uh, legacy CUDA atomics. You sort of have to build those yourself using fences, which is very error prone. Um, they're all device only. And the memory scope is a property of, op of operations, not objects. And likewise, atomicity is a property of operations, not objects. Um, you know, you're, you operate on int stars, not uh, uh, atomic ints. And uh, likewise, and this is just a general note for C++ programmers, stop using volatile for synchronization because it, it, volatile does not imply atomicity. Volatile is a very vague pact with undefined behavior. And even if it happens to work on some of your platforms, it doesn't mean that those semantics are guaranteed that they'll work in production or that they won't be broken down the road. Atomic T has clear semantics and that's what you should be using to avoid uh, being surprised by, um, you know, odd race conditions or compiler or hardware changes. All right, so next I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, a new C++ 20 synchronization primitive called uh, std barrier. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of interesting story. Um, we didn't originally uh, intend for std barrier to become a, a sort of key part of uh, uh, the CUDA programming model, but it's ended up that way. Um, it wasn't even originally our proposal, but we we saw that uh, uh, we saw the barrier proposal coming in, and we knew we were working on something in the chip that we just launched last week. Um, and we we realized that we could use std barrier as the exposure for this hardware feature, and that's exactly what we've done. So we've we've um, shipped uh, a version of C plus plus twenties std barrier in uh, in 2020, and we've also shipped hardware that accelerates um, that barrier. So let's talk a little bit about the problem. So in CUDA, there's um, a number of different ways to um, uh, request that all the threads in a certain level of the hierarchy synchronize. And I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pick on sync threads for now. So sync threads is a primitive that you can use and it says that all, you know, like basically all of the other threads in um, the current block that you're in um, we'll need to call sync threads too, and, and nobody will exit the sync threads call until everybody has entered the call here. Now, there's some limitations with this. It only works within blocks. If you need to synchronize um, uh, across blocks, um, you have to go build something yourself. And it only synchronizes all of the threads in the block. There's no option for some of the threads to not participate in the synchronization. Um, there's also only really one barrier. You'll, you'll notice this is just a function that takes no arguments. There's no way for you to say, I want you, know, you to synchronize, like this, is, it's this particular synchronization is the one that I want you to participate in. It's just this one barrier and you have to make sure that all the other threads line up and happen to be um, calling sync threads at the same time as you. Um, and there's also you know, issues of like, what if I want to synchronize with the host? Um, uh, and yeah, okay, so 
C++20 introduces std barrier, and we have it in libq++. We also have our, our, our extended version that takes um, thread scopes. And a barrier object, it's just sort of a, a modern version of that other API here. So the, the most common use of a barrier is that you distribute it to your threads, and then those threads call arrive and wait. Um, and that, when you call arrive and wait, it means um, I, I want to block on this call until everybody else has called arrive and wait. And when you construct a barrier, you give it a count of how many threads are expected to arrive at each phase of the barrier. So this is, this is a nice um, abstraction because uh, it gives us a uniform API for synchronization at different levels of the thread hierarchy. So we can have the same syntax for synchronizing just the threads within a block in a very optimized fashion. And um, uh, for synchronizing uh, uh, across all threads in the GPU or even synchronizing threads in the CPU and threads in the GPU using a barrier with the system scope. So this is what the barrier um, API looks like. Um, I'm not gonna get into too many details in this talk about um, uh, all the particulars of it. If you're interested in learning more about that, again, go look at my uh, C++20 synchronization library talk. I'm, I'm gonna primarily just introduce you to three different APIs um, today. The first of those is Arrive. So Arrive is an asynchronous um, our arrival on the barrier. So arrive doesn't actually block. What arrive does is it says, hey, I've reached, you know, I've reached the barrier. Um, I've done all the things that I needed to do and that I need to make visible to other threads, but I don't want to block and wait for them yet because I have some other things I can go do. And so what arrive does is it, is it, uh, uh, it decrements the barrier count and it gives you back this arrival token. And that arrival token you can use to later wait on it using the wait API here, which takes one of these arrival tokens. So this, um, this notion of an asynchronous barrier is um, a fairly novel thing. A lot of you are probably familiar with the notion of like a thread barrier, but the notion of an asynchronous thread barrier is sort of a newfangled thing here. And that's why, you know, we have arrive and wait, which is just sort of the convenience form here. That is the ver version where you both arrive and block on the barrier in the same step. So if you're familiar with barriers in other programming languages, this, the arrive and wait API is um, uh, probably the, the closest um, uh, approximation. All right, so let's look at, let's look at an example of um, why this is useful. So here I've got some sort of simple stencil code. So each thread is gonna call this code and they're gonna, each thread will have ownership of one element in some array. And um, what they're gonna do is for some number of iterations, they are going to call some function called stencil and compute a new value for their cell. And then they're going to assign that new value to their cell. Um, but, but there's a little bit of synchronization that has to happen here. First of all, you have to ensure that you, when you read your neighbor cells, because this stencil function, it reads from the cell of the, the thread to your left and from the cell of the thread to your right, that's the u n minus one and u n plus one here. So when you read those two values, you want to make sure that you've read those values before the um, the, your neighbor threads have done their right for the current iteration. Because otherwise you might, you know, read the, the left neighbor's value after he's updated it um, and the right neighbor's value before he's updated it. Um, and that would be incorrect. So we need to, we need to ensure that we um, uh, uh, see the correct that version of our neighbor's value. And, and then the other like sort of component of that is to ensure that we need to ensure that um, our neighbors see our right at the correct time. So the way that we do this is we, we put a, um, a, uh, a barrier both before and after our right here. And the barrier um, uh, before um, the right tells all of our neighbors, hey, everybody who needed to read the value of your cell 
has read it, it is now okay for you to overwrite it. And then the second barrier after the write um, ensures that the write is seen by all of the threads. And if you delete either of these two barriers, you have a bug here. If you delete the first barrier here, the first sync threads, then it's possible that you will do the write before one of your neighbors has read your old value. And if you delete the second um, sync threads here, it's possible that on the next iteration, one of your neighbors will read your old value before your write has completed. Now, this, the way that this is structured is a little bit unfortunate because we've written in such a way that every thread must wait for every other thread to read its neighbor's values and finish the computation of this stencil um, function before it can start with the store. So, and, and, and one of the reasons why that's particularly expensive on a GPU is because on a GPU, stores are way more expensive than loads. Um, in particular, because we can hide a lot of latency of loads, but it's a lot harder to hide the latency of stores. Okay, so here's a, a slightly modified version of this function. And in this version, um, we've moved the call to this stencil function from being inside of uh, these two barriers, uh, from being out uh, before these two barriers to being inside of these two barriers. And so what we do is at the start of each iteration, we read the neighbor values um, and then we do a barrier and then we um, call the stencil function and pass it the uh, neighbor values that we read. And what this does is it allows us to only have to wait for each other thread to read its neighbor values before it can start computing. So previously we had to wait for each one of our neighbors to both read the neighbor values and then also for them to compute their stencil function before um, uh, we could proceed. So this version is maybe slightly better. Okay, now let's look at the version that uses asynchronous barriers. So this is, this is a little bit of a, of a um, mind game, so uh, I, we'll, we'll just walk through it. So it's, it's the same, basic idea as the previous example here. So we start off in this in, inside loop um, by reading the neighbor values to the left and to the right. And then we do an asynchronous arrival. And that asynchronous arrival is to signal to all of our neighbors, hey, we have read the value from you. Like we've seen the value, you may now proceed to start like messing around with the value. Then um, uh, we go and uh, call the stencil function. And then we go and wait on the, uh, the token uh, that we got from arrive. And then finally, we go and we assign, after, after that wait, we go and assign to um, the, uh, 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 to the, um, cell that we own, that should be un, not un minus one. And um, then we do an arrive and wait to make sure that everybody can see our update. So the benefit of this approach is that by doing the asynchronous arrival, we don't have to wait for all of our neighbors to read their values. So in this previous example here, we, you know, we had this line where we read the values, then we do a sync threads and we wait for everybody else to read the values. Then we go and start doing our computation. In this version right here, we don't have to wait for everybody else. All that we have to do is tell everybody else after we've read the values. And we can do that by asynchronously arriving. And then we can start our computation immediately. So this is a little bit more efficient, especially if you've got um, a non-uniform workload because you, by using asynchrony, we're able to um, uh, proceed further in our computation before we need to block. Okay, so sort of the, the moral of, uh, of the story here is that um, uh, libcoop plus plus is designed to um, expose um, uh, the, the capabilities of modern NVIDIA GPUs, in particular, 
um, the C++ parallel forward progress guarantees and the C++ memory model. And you might be wondering, well, like, wh why does this matter? Like, okay, sure, the, the old way that you'd write things was perhaps somewhat ugly, um, but, uh, but what is the benefit of going to all this trouble of actually, you know, putting hardware support in for um, the C++ memory model and C++ parallel forward progress guarantees? Well, the, the reason is that by doing this, um, we're able to enable um, our GPUs to run a wide range of concurrent algorithms and data structures that were previously unavailable on GPUs. Okay, so this chart um, uh, is a, shows a taxonomy of concurrent algorithms. And understanding the chart is not particularly important right now. The, the main takeaways are that uh, you can divide this chart into two sections. There's algorithms on the left, which are non-blocking algorithms, and there's algorithms on the right, which are blocking algorithms. Now, the majority of the synchronization algorithms that you've used, or the majority of the synchronization code that you've written, probably falls into the category on the right of blocking code. Now, pre-Volta NVIDIA GPUs, and GPUs manufactured by companies that are not mine, um, provide what C++ calls weekly parallel forward progress guarantees. And the details of this isn't important in this talk. If you're interested in learning more about that, you should go watch my uh, talk, uh, the C++ execution model. Um, I'm sure Connor will go dig up a link for that too. But the, the important takeaway is that if you only have weekly parallel forward progress guarantees, the only types of concurrent algorithms that you can write are non-blocking concurrent algorithms. Because with weekly parallel forward progress guarantees, if you block, you potentially, you, you, you no longer guarantee forward progress. You potentially hang your system. So the, these sorts of platforms that only provide weekly parallel forward progress guarantees, um, they greatly restrict the types of concurrent code that we can write. Um, for example, the simple signaling and polling functions we looked at before, you couldn't use those on this platform because they use blocking. They were polling on that variable. So even that very basic pattern, you can't use. Most types of mutexes, you can't use. Now, on Volta and newer NVIDIA GPUs, you have parallel forward progress guarantees. And this means that you can use any type of concurrent algorithm that you could possibly think of. So anything, any type of concurrent, uh, uh, concurrent primitive that you could write on a CPU, you could also write on a modern NVIDIA GPU. So the reason that this is important because this, this opens up um, whole new realms of applications that can run on our GPUs because more concurrent algorithms and data structures means that it's you know, more feasible or possible for you to just take your code and port it to run on the GPU. So now I'll, I'm gonna walk through one uh, uh, final example. Um, uh, and that is um, building a concurrent GPU hash table. Um, and the reason I like this example is it sort of challenges people's assumptions about what GPUs are good at. Um, people assume that GPUs are designed for like doing lots of floating point math and that they're only really good at arrays and that they're bad at random um, uh, memory access. And none of those things are actually um, uh, particularly true today. Um, so, okay, let's get started. Um, uh, for this concurrent hash table, we're gonna use open addressing and linear probing, both for simplicity and for performance. And the insertion algorithm that I'm gonna show you does not handle um, uh, resizing of or growing of the hash table. So it's sort of a fixed size hash table. All right, so first let's look at like the constituent components of this data structure. So first we have, you know, the capacity, which as I said, it, it's for this exercise just gonna be fixed. Um, then we have an array for the keys and we have an array for the values. And then we have an array of um, uh, state values for each key and value. And we're gonna call, um, 
we're going to call one entry in each one of these three arrays a slot. So a slot consists of a state, a key, and a value. And the state of each slot is either empty, reserved, or filled. And they transition linearly between those states. So you go from being empty to being reserved, then you go from being reserved to being filled. And then finally, we have our hash function and our um, equality operation. Okay, so now let's look at our concurrent insertion algorithm here. And I've made a little flow chart to um, uh, explain how this works. Um, one thing that we should note is that we're not, we don't support removal in this little example. And also, if we find a, um, if, if, if there's already a key in the hash table um, uh, for the key that we're trying to insert, we don't overwrite it. We just um, fail to insert and return null pointer. Okay, so here's the, uh, the little flowchart. So we start at the top here. So the first thing we try to do is we, you know, we pick some slot that we're gonna start with um, uh, as our first candidate. Um, and then we try to set that slot to reserved. And if we succeed, it's pretty straightforward. If we succeed, then we fill the slot with the key and value, and then we set the slot to be filled, and then we return, hey, insertion succeeded. Now, if the slot was already reserved, um, then all we need to do is wait for the slot to become filled, because if the slot's reserved, it means that some other thread is currently filling that slot, and eventually they'll finish up and then we can proceed onwards. So if we tried to set it to empty and uh, the slot is already filled or it was reserved and we waited until it became filled, then we were not the ones to insert a key into this slot, somebody else did. So what we wanna do is we wanna check whether um, uh, this was a collision or whether um, we found uh, our key in the table, meaning that somebody else already inserted it and we're done. So to do that, we just check if the key that we're trying to insert is equal to the key in the slot. And if they're equal, then insertion failed. Somebody already inserted this key into the map. We just return null pointer. And if they're not equal, then we've had a collision. And in that case, we're just gonna go and select the next candidate slot, again, using linear probing, and we'll start this whole process over again. All right, so let's look at the code. Okay, so first thing we do is we go and compute our initial uh, index in the, uh, the slot array. So, you know, where are we gonna start um, uh, uh, probing? Um, then we're gonna have a uh, for loop, and this for loop is gonna linearly probe up to capacity times. Um, and we do that because we don't want to um, have an infinite loop here. If we've tried to insert up to capacity times and we've, we've failed, then we've tried every slot and uh, uh, we, we were unsuccessful, which means that the container is full and we should just return null pointer. Okay, so now let's go into that little probing loop. And now we're gonna see in that probing loop the, uh, the, um, the sequence from that diagram. Okay, so the first thing we do is we go and lo load the, the state of the slot. And then um, we check, well, was the state of the slot empty? And if it was empty, then we're going to try to set the state of that slot from empty to being reserved. And you can think of this as we're trying to lock the slot. You know, if we succeed in being the one to set the slot um, atomically to be reserved, then we know nobody else succeeded, which means that we, we, we now own that slot and we can now insert into that slot. Okay, so what we do is in this while loop, we do a compare exchange week, um, which is an operation that attempts, attempts to set um, the, the state of this slot um, to be reserved. And if that operation succeeds, then we've locked it. So we were the ones who set it to reserve. So now we just need to insert the key and value. And we'll just do that with placement new here. And then afterwards, after we've done the insertion, now we need to take the slot, which is reserved, and we need to make it filled. And we do that by doing a store to um, uh, the uh, state 
uh, with memory order release. And we do memory order release here because we want to ensure that any other threads that observe that the slot is now filled, we want them to also see our store of the key and the value, which note are not atomic variables. The key and the value are just regular C++ variables. But by using memory order release, we've ensured an interthread um, memory ordering that if somebody, if another thread sees the R store of filled, then they will also have seen any stores, atomic or non-atomic, that happened before that store. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing that we did in our um, signal and polling example earlier. We're going to call this notify all, which will wake up anyone that was waiting for us to fill the slot. And we'll see the other end of that in a minute. And then we're done. We successfully inserted. So we just return a pointer to the slot in which, which we inserted into, to the particular a pointer to the value um, uh, element that we successfully inserted. OK, if we didn't fill the slot, um, then we want to wait for the slot to become filled and then go and check whether there was a collision or whether it, um, it, somebody already inserted our key. And so to do that waiting, we could just do a naive while loop here where we just spin until um, uh, the state of the slot is no longer reserved and is filled. And we, we know with certainty that that's going to happen. We know that we've seen that the state of the slot was not empty, um, which means that it's either reserved or filled. And we know that if it's reserved, eventually some other thread is going to set it to filled. Now, we can make this a little bit better by using that wait API here. So we'd say, you know, wait until um, that slot is no longer equal to reserved. And again, we, 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 prior to this line of code, we've established that the state of the slot is not equal to empty. That's why we're here. And so if it's not equal to empty, then it's either reserved, in which case this wait loop will, you know, wait until it's no longer reserved, or it's filled. And if it's filled, then this wait call will just return immediately because we said, hey, wait until the value of, of this atomic is no longer equal to reserved. And it'll just say, well, hey, it's already no longer equal to reserved. There, done, bam. Okay. So next, um, we now know that uh, the slot has been filled and we can see the value that it has been filled because of the, uh, the memory order release and because of the paired memory order acquire in this wait operation here, which ensures that we'll see whatever got written before the release here. So now we can go and check whether our key equals the key that was inserted into this slot. And if it does, uh, then somebody else inserted. And that means that we're just going to return a pointer to the value that they inserted. Um, so insertion failed. Uh, we were not successful in inserting our value. OK. Now, if the keys weren't equal, then we have a collision. The keys didn't match, but we happened to, um, uh, to, to, to stumble upon this slot. So you know, the, uh, whatever the key was that, was that was in this slot, either it happened to hash the same as us, or it, um, uh, it had some collision with some other key. And then because of linear probing, it ended up in this slot. So all that we're going to do is we're just going to go and try the next slot. And we'll just do a modulo here to wrap around to the start um, uh, if we go past the end. OK, and that is it. This is a, an efficient GPU implementation of concurrent insertion into a hash map. Um, I'm not going to show you the algorithm for lookup, but it's, it's um, the same basic principles. And there's actually a lot of stuff that you can do with this. This is um, this basic algorithm is used to power um, uh, if, uh, high performance implementations of uh, parallel join and group by operations, which are commonly used in data analytics and database processing. Um, if you're doing any sort of string processing, something like this is incredibly useful. And this this sort of data structure, you you could not write this on uh, a GPU before Volta. 
um, it would deadlock because there's blocking here. You know, we, we do this blocking while we're waiting for slots um, uh, that are reserved to become filled. Um, so this is sort of an example of what I mean of, of some, some useful concurrent algorithm that is enabled by um, uh, our strong conformance to the C++ uh, memory model and forward progress um, model. Okay, so the point here is that there's this whole new world of algorithms and data structures that can be accelerated with Volta Plus and NVIDIA GPUs using libq++ atomics and synchronization primitives. So uh, here's my sort of summary slide. So libq++, it is the opt-in heterogeneous incremental C++ standard library for CUDA. It's open source. Um, in CUDA 10.2, there's um, atomics and type traits. In CUDA 11.0, there's um, wait and notify, which we talked about, barrier, which we talked about, um, memcopy async, which uh, I didn't talk about. My colleague Olivier talked about that in his talk at GTC last week. Then there's latch, which is basically just a watered down version of uh, barrier. If you're interested in learning more about that, um, uh, it's a new C++20 feature. You can go watch my C++20 synchronization library talk. Likewise for semaphore, that's a new thing in C++20. Um, you can go watch my the same talk for that. Um, then we also have uh, chrono, ratio, limits, functional in 11.0. And then we've got a long list of things that we're working on bringing in the future. Um, uh, Atomic Ref, which is another part of the C++20 synchronization library, is pretty high on that list. And then things like tuple, pair, array, utility, eventually things like string processing. All righty, that is it. I will now take questions if people have questions. Uh, I have one for you. Yep. With all of that, I guess like the algorithm uh, editor will uh, one day be in libq++, what will happen to trust? Uh, um, that's a good question. I keep getting that question a lot. Um, I think that probably, so Thrust's original mandate in life was being a parallel algorithms library, um, not being a general purpose CUDA, you know, ease of use library. So I think that Thrust will probably go back to its roots of being a parallel algorithms library. Um, we are planning uh, a Thrust um, uh, 2.0 in the C++ 23 timeframe, which will include, um, it, it'll essentially be based around C++ 23 executors and uh, ranges. Um, Connor, will, Connor will probably design most of it. Um, and uh, uh, that will, at that point, we'll probably base that entirely on um, libq++. And so a lot of the things that you used to use um, Thrust for, um, like maybe they'll be there as type aliases. But the other thing is that a lot of the things that you used to use Thrust for, you just don't need to use Thrust for, like host vector and device vector. You don't need to use that if you just rely on unified memory. Um, uh, another cool thing to go um, uh, uh, check out is we just launched our C++ 17 parallel algorithms library, um, which is, or parallel algorithms implementation, which is a part of um, the NVC++ compiler that we just launched. And um, that, just, that just magically makes, it just magically takes your parallel algorithm calls and GPU accelerates them and just magically transparently makes thing like standard library things work um, on the GPU. So if you have that, then you, you have much less of a need for a lot of the things that are in uh, Thrust. And I saw a question about GPU coroutines. Um, yeah, so my colleague Olivier actually um, uh, tried it out and if, if as long as, as long as you, as long as heap elision happens, it works with um, uh, LLVM coroutines. Obviously, if you need, um, if if the compiler can't heap elide and and um, uh, um, devirtualize the coroutine, um, which would only really happen if you were using, um, uh, if you weren't using whole program compilation. Um, but but if it can't see through that, then it's you know going to be unhappy because it it's going to be like, hey, where's your allocator? And I can't really do 
this uh, type erasure on the GPU. So, but uh, yeah, I suspect that we'll have that working. Um, cross CPU and GPU coroutine, like being able to suspend on the host and resume on the device. Yeah, that's not, that's not, that's not in the near term plans for NVCC. All right, anybody have any other questions? I have a comment, Bryce. Yeah. You have a, a real missed opportunity in the earlier slides when you were using the uh, caret or circumflex for an up arrow and the V for a down arrow. Yeah. APL has uh, Unicode characters for the algorithms take and drop, which are the up and down arrows. You really, you could have worked some APL into your slides there. That's all I have to comment. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I think I'm good. Thanks, buddy. But uh, I think we're I think we're good. <laughs> My uh, th these slides are strictly ASCII. <laughs> Bryce, a, a couple slides back, when you're checking to state whether it was empty before, you wrapped it in a while loop, and I missed why it's a while and not just an if. Oh, because um, because spurious failures. Uh, hang on. Um, because the the cast might fail. I mean, I could, yeah. So, so the the, re the reason I do that is because um, uh, compare exchange might um, spuriously fail. Yeah, I thought that, but it, but you were checking. I thought you were checking a local non-atomic against just an, an enum but i anyway i couldn't be sure oh yeah, yeah. so you you we're checking old against against this enum yeah but the the way that compare exchange week works the first parameter is what you expect it to be and if if um your expectation was not met then it assigns to old so after this call to, if if compare exchange week returns false here then old has been updated to whatever the the latest value um, uh, of states index was seen. Um, so it's po in the case of a spurious failure, it's possible that that this returns false, but that old is still state empty. In case in which case we just want to retry again. I, I mean, I I I could potentially rewrite this to use compare exchange strong. Um, yeah, I could probably just do while. Mm. No, the the benefit to doing it this way is, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. There might be a, a oh, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Hang on. Um. Yeah, so sorry. So this um uh this call to compare exchange week right here, uh if it returns false, then the value then old is a reference parameter and old has been updated with whatever uh the whatever value it observed from state's index. And so that value might it, it is possible that this returns false, um uh that it, it failed to set it even though it saw a value of state empty because this is a compare exchange week, in which case we just go into the while loop and retry. Make sense? Total sense. Yeah, there's probably a better way to write this. I'd have to think about it. I'm sure there was a reason I did it this way. I mean, okay, so so the 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 other way to write this would be to um, to just guess what the uh, initial value would be. So if in, instead of doing this load first, if we just assume that the initial value was state empty, then we could just do old equals state empty, um, and uh, uh, eh, I'd have to think about this more. I could probably rewrite this with the compare exchange strong and it would probably be clearer. 
All right, any other questions? There's one in the Zoom group chat uh, from yep. Brian Sharp. Uh, will these new concurrency, concurrency feature work on older GPU? Uh, um, like slowly, like a fallback or any, or it's Volta Plus only? Um, they will work on Volta Plus GPU. I mean, it, it like the, the silicon does not support it on non-NVIDIA GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs older than Volta. Um, but uh, Volta is older GPUs now. Now it came out in like 2017. <sighs> yeah, so the, the, I mean, the, the problem is, I can actually show you why, um, if I can go find the slide, it is, I think I know what the slide is. I have many slides. Um, the feature is this thing called independent thread scheduling. Um, um, here we go. It's probably somewhere in this slide deck. Now, yeah, but I don't have the older version. Okay, I have to go find Olivier's slide deck. Uh, Volta, inside Volta. Uh, here, I'll share my screen again. You're already sharing. Oh, I am? Yeah, what do you know? Is it just the this one? You're sharing the multiprocess time slicing. Um, huh. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Hang on. I bet that'll uh Yeah, here we go. Uh, yep, so that is weird. Okay, I'll just drag it over there. I'll make it easier. Yeah, so um, on older GPUs and GPUs not manufactured by NVIDIA, the way that you deal with divergence, because GPUs are essentially just like heavily multi-threaded processors. So, you know, you have one one sort of functional th like hardware thread executes 32 logical software threads, which are frequently called a warp. And um, uh, in, in the traditional model, you have, um, uh, you have one, um, uh, program counter for each one of those 32 threads and one stack for each one of those 32 threads. So each one of your thread, like your, your threads cannot be at independent places in the program. Um, so then how do we handle divergence? Well, if you've got a branch like an if and then an else, um, the way that we do it is we just execute it in order. So we we execute the a b statement and we tell with you know the threads that meet the first branch and then we execute the x y statement but this is done linearly in time so these two statements never are ne never happen like never overlap and the ordering in which they're executed is always like some implementation you know defined thing so the problem is if you put some synchronization, like if you attempt to synchronize, to do blocking synchronization between these threads, between threads that are in this um, uh, code path and this code path, you're going to have a problem because in this first code path here, you're saying, hey, block until all the other threads arrive. But this code is being executed sequentially. So you're saying block until all the other threads arrive but the other threads will never arrive because you will never 
you will never move past this point and go and execute the other threads because it's not po it's not possible for the hardware to have these groups of threads be in two places at the same time. So on Volta and newer NVIDIA GPUs, um, we have what's called independent thread scheduling. So every one of the uh, threads has their own program counter. And um, there's some magical scheduling technology des designed by my uh, colleague Olivier that um, uh, ensures that they eventually reconverge to be um, uh, uh, sort of working on the same thing at the same time. So on Volta, if you have synchronization in the middle of a divergent path, it's fine because the clever scheduler will see, hey, I, I see what you're doing there. I'm going, I'm going to ensure that this makes forward progress by not blocking the entire, um, uh, the entire group of threads when you want uh, 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 to, to wait for one of your buddies here. So that's, that's, that's essentially how we make this work. Any other questions? Uh, I, don't, I can't see if there's any in the chat. Uh, Amon Desmarais um, asked, where can I locate libq++ container support documentation? I might be blind, but having trouble seeing it in the, tool, uh, in the toolkit docs. Um, yeah, it's there will be documentation in CUDA 11. Um, th there are not containers um, in the current release of libq++, though. If you need like containers, um, use Thrust containers, or we have another another project coming down the road there. I mean, okay, we'll probably eventually have std string. Std string is like next in my to-do list. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, if there's no more question for Bryce, well, Thank you, Bryce, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Um, yeah, uh, there's a bunch of uh, clapping in that we can see all around. Thank you all. Um, just uh, a couple of uh, closing uh, remarks. Uh, if people are still looking for a job at this point or you are still um, you can offer jobs uh, write it down in the comments well comments the <laughs> I'm on YouTube suddenly uh, write it down in the chat uh, and try to connect everybody with uh, that's looking at for a job with people that can offer them a job and thank you again Bryce <laughs>